Hello all and happy Brain Awareness Week. Uh, I am Kelsey Lucerne. I am one of the co-presidents of MINDS and welcome to our fourth annual public lecture series. Uh, today we are joined by two resident experts in social neuroscience, PhD candidate Joseph Simon and Dr. Anastasia Schuster. And today they're going to be giving us two talks on the social brain and the adaptability of the brain. So following their two talks, we are going to be uh, holding a Q&A panel with our speakers, and we'll be asking them questions that we solicited uh, online through social media. Now these talks are pre-recorded, so if anyone watching this now has any comments or questions, feel free to drop them below and our team will respond to you. First, we're going to hear from PhD candidate uh, Joseph Simon. So Joe got his uh, Bachelor's of Science in Neuroscience in 2014 from UCLA. He's now completing his doctoral work in neuroscience in the laboratory of Dr. Aaron Rich, where he studies social behavior and decision making. So today, Joe is going to be giving us a talk about why we socialize and uh, how socialization has been beneficial for us as a species. Hey everybody, welcome to the public lecture. My name is Joe Simon, and today we'll be talking about a subject very near and dear to my heart, it is the story of the social brain. So let's get into it. What does it mean to be social? Well, social behaviors result from a complex interaction between individuals and their environment. Examples of this are like the culture and the family. And actions of group members affect other group members. So being social means that you are what I do or what somebody else does affects as a re reaction on what's happening within the group. And also the brain development and genetics are important uh, factors in social interaction. So how the brain develops and you know our uh, idiosyncrasies result in um, how our play our role in how uh, our social interactions uh, develop. Thus, our social behavior is results from the influence of biology and an individual's environment. So, what are types of social species? Well, we have one right here: humans. Obviously, uh, we are very social, though we can't be as much right now. Uh, but there are also other social species like monkeys dolphins, and even prairie wolves, who are a very social species. So with all of this uh, said, what is the interaction between our social behavior and the brain? So social information uh, processing is dispersed throughout the brain. And for example, there are individual nodes, like those of Bernicke's and uh, uh, <laughs> Broca's and Bernicke's area, which are inv involved in language processing in other areas that are involved in facial recognition and emotional processing. And all of these areas work in tandem to help us make decisions and uh, learning of proper social interactions. And one way to do that is through communication. And communication is a key feature of social behavior. And there, what are types of social communication? Well, a couple are nonverbal in, in the form of Facial expressions, you know, I can make a happy face, a sad face, different things like that. Tones, I can increase the tone of my voice or decrease the tone of my voice. And gestures, like I'm doing right now with my hands. I am, these are all forms of communication that allow you to understand what I'm saying without me using any actual verbiage. And speaking of verbiage, there is speech. Speech and also sign language. Though so people think sign language is nonverbal, is actually using words and sentences and structure to convey information. So therefore, it is a form of verbal uh, communication. On top of that, it all starts early. Babies can recognize the difference between strangers and their parents. And they can use gestures like the boy crying right here with a, a very underwhelming Santa Claus um, as he's trying to get uh, back to his mother or father. And they use this, they use these gestures before they uh, are able to even speak. And the question is, are these forms of communication, are they universal, are they unique? 
Well, while some types are universal, for example, a smile, you know, a sad face, a fearful face, or anger, other forms are unique. You can think of language. Language is region specific. And you can also think of other um, nonverbal forms, which, you know, different types of gestures that might be okay in one area or bad in another area. For example, thumbs up. So what is the evolution of the social brains? So humans are social creatures who work in units to survive. And this need to survive and reproduce um, leads to pair bonding and parental care. You can see two parents here, you know, shielding over their kids. And there are neuropeptides or, uh, or different type of chemicals in the brain like oxytocin that help facilitate uh, these interactions and more like the pair bonding between a parent and a child. You, the people like to call, call oxytocin like the love chemical, for example. Um, and the growth of the neocortex, the most outer layer of the brain, uh, helps facilitate social cognition. So we can see a bunch of areas right here that are involved um, in uh, these abilities. Additionally, the size, the size of our social network uh, has a positive correlation with our ability uh, to understand others. So, and this correlation has far reaching implications. For, for one, these interactions uh, with different people and cultures increase our ability um, to predict and interpret um, social situations. And I think even more importantly, it promotes the idea of diversity within social settings, as it allows us to have interactions with different types of people, which allows for us to have a better understanding of others. So if social interactions are any social information, is it hardwired within us? Well, like I was saying before about the baby, you know, gesturing out, this starts soon after birth. Additionally, babies can follow gaze, which is known as gaze following. And it is a, it is a process of shared attention, which is also a theory of mind meaning that I understand that you are looking somewhere. I can predict what you're, or perceive what you are doing as the baby is doing right here. He's following the gaze of that lady uh, to this uh, toy to, I guess, his right. We also see facial expressions even in inanimate objects, a phenomenon known as face uh, pareidolia, par well, sorry, pareidolia, excuse me, um, where we see patients, where, where they aren't even there. You know, these are uh, very scared uh, peppers right here, green peppers. Um, it's not really actually happening, but we are able to perceive that. So, and also when there are lesions of the, uh, of the social brain areas, uh, this can result in the uh, ab abnormal social functions. So if we lose an area, we are not able to uh, continue to function properly in social situations, like we see here with Phineas Gage and the Iron Rod. The uh, story of Phineas Gage here, and I think it was like the 1880s, he was a, a railroad, rail, railroad worker, and he uh, had an accident where an iron rod went through, uh, well, you can see it went through his skull. Um, and uh, he did not die, as you can see, he's uh, holding the rod right there, but he did uh, develop abnormal uh, behaviors, including those in the social domain. So to answer this question, they are kind of hardwired. We, we do have, uh, our brain is developed for social interaction. It is hardwired for that. Like we can see with smiles here. And humans find social interactions very rewarding. You know, all these smiles, I'm sure you're feeling pretty happy right now seeing the faces up here, seeing my smiling face. Um, but the activation of reward-related regions, like the nucleus accumbens, are positively, uh, what's it called, correlated with positive interactions of others. So you can think of it as like, you know, you're getting money, you're very happy. Well, also when you see somebody smiling, or we, you know, you hug your, your grandmother, for example, you also feel a, a sense of reward, a sense of, sense of pleasure. You know, the opposite end, just a lack of social interaction uh, can result in feelings of loneliness, and, and uh, allows us to, or makes us, drives us to want to seek out others. And, you know, uh, if we you know, can't do that, we, it becomes even deeper. You can think of it as a type of depression. 
you know I was going to get to it, the advent of uh, social media and what I'm calling hyper sociability. So social media outlets like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram have increased the amount of social interactions we, are, we engage in daily. And these online interactions remove the social uh, cues that we use to interact with, uh, with, with each other. And the reason I put social in quotes is because we're not actually physically engaging with people. So therefore we cannot actually use the cues that over evolution we have developed to uh, understand what others are, are thinking and feeling. And this ultimately affects our ability to perceive the intentions of others and engage in normal social functions. You could think of emojis or laugh out loud. You could see you know, somebody's texting, you know, laugh out loud or LOL, they're not actually laughing out loud. You know, so this is actually a loss of these uh, social cues that we're actually using. So a question I pose is, what is the cost of this change in human sociability? And I'll leave that up to you to decide for yourself. And finally, what happens when we are unable to be social? The recent pandemic has shown us that it is very difficult to not be social. And we are naturally social creatures, so trying to tell us to not do this is challenging. And it ultimately, you know, is unhealthy from a mental standpoint. But with that being said, you know, we always find new ways to be social. We find new ways to go out and talk to other people. We find ways to be around each other because that's what we'll do. And, you know, that's what Ian was saying, you know, while this is happening around us, just remember that, you know, like it's always okay to interact with people, always okay to check up on people because that is our nature to be social. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for that illuminating talk. Now we're going to be turning things over to Dr. Anastasia Schuster. So Dr. Schuster got her PhD from Tel Aviv University in 2018. She is currently a postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Zhao Zigu's laboratory in the Computational Psychiatry Unit at Mount Sinai. Dr. Schuster studies in Dr. Gu's lab, looking at individual differences in um, social decision-making and how social norms affect these behavior. Now, Dr. Schuster is going to be giving us a talk on how social interactions affect the brain and the adaptability of the brain to social norms. Hi, I'm Anastasia. I'd like to talk to you today about social behavior and its relationship to mental health and how COVID has impacted both. So I don't need to tell you this, but humans are highly social animals. The average person spends most of their day interacting with other people. And we're not just social, we're actually pro-social. So humans have evolved to uh, display a host of pro-social behaviors. We're altruistic, we're fair, we're cooperative. And neuroscience tells us that when we behave in these pro-social ways, uh, for example, when we uh, donate money to charity, the same parts of the brain light up as when we actually receive reward, like if we get money or if we eat a food that we like. So that suggests that being pro-social is intrinsically rewarding for us. Another line of work from neuroscience shows that not only are we pro-social and social, it seems that the part of the brain that is called a default mode network, and that is the part of the brain that is active when we're really not doing anything. So if we're just staring blankly into space, not thinking about anything in particular, that part, those parts of the brain that are active usually overlap with the parts of the brain that are part of the social network uh, of the brain. And those are the parts that are active when we think about other people or interact with other people. And this overlap, in fact, it's the same regions that are active when we're not really doing anything and the regions that are active when we're socially interacting with others suggests that when, when we're not doing anything, we're really doing something that has a social function. So these evidence suggests that we are highly social and our brains are highly social, which is really interesting. 
being so social comes with a price. It makes us very vulnerable to uh, what happens when we are deprived of our social lives. Indeed, uh, loneliness and social isolation is uh, linked to poor mental and physical health. This is especially true for um, older adults where being lonely can increase the uh, likelihood of dying by 30%, which is uh, huge. And cases of isolation at its extreme, like what happens with um, when people undergo solitary confinement, shows there's a whole range of negative implications to loneliness at its extreme, from cognitive impairments, um, that means difficulty thinking, focusing, remembering, as well as an increase of uh, risk for mental health. So the flip side of that, the fact that loneliness uh, leads to poor health, is that social support is really protective of our health. Again, both physical and mental. Social support could be our friends and family, could also be belonging to organizations such as a religious group or hobbies, which you do uh, in a group like singing in a choir. Um, so these social support, so social support or being part of a social network uh, is linked to reduce rates of various um, mental illnesses, but also just overall mortality. Of course, the, the direction of the uh, relationship is not very clear. So we tend to think about it as if social support uh, protects us, protects our health. But it could also be the case of people who are more prone to mental illness or have or physical health would also withdraw from society or be uh, pushed away from society. So although it's not clear what is the relationship, it is clear that social support is a huge beneficial factor in our mental health. Recently, the uh, neuroimaging study came out that showed specifically that, showing that social isolation can elicit a very similar brain neural response, as is craving for food, so being hungry. The way they did it is that they asked participants to fast for 10 hours and then put them in an fMRI scanner to look at their neural responses for images of food. And they saw these parts of the brain that, if you remember, really um, are very similar to what we saw before with the reward system. So this part of the brain is the reward system and it's active when you're hungry and you're looking at images of foods. The same people then came back and then they underwent 10 hours of social isolation. So they couldn't see other people, talk to other people, couldn't be on social media, etc. After 10 hours, they were shown images of social interactions. And lo and behold, it's the same parts of the brain that lit up. Not only is the same parts, but they saw this linear relationship such that much like when you're hungry, the hungrier they, you are, the more your brain is active when you see images of food, the lonelier you are at the end of those 10 hours, the more your reward system of the brain is active when you look at images of social interactions. So taken together, it shows that really much like food, social interactions are a basic human um, need. And we're motivated to seek it out, much like we're motivated to seek out food when we're hungry. And then COVID happened. Um, with its uh, re risk for our physical health, COVID-19 poses a huge risk for our mental health, of course, because social distancing seemed to be one of the biggest ways in which we can protect ourselves. And indeed, the social and indeed, mental health has deteriorated significantly in the U.S. and all over the world. So these are numbers from the U.S. Uh, adult population from the last, last summer, so from June, showing that anxiety went up three times uh, compared to pre-COVID levels. Depression went up four times. So these numbers, they mean one in four people in the United States is either depressed or anxious. And one in 10 has either started or increased their substance use. So that would be alcohol or drugs. Of course, not everybody are similarly affected by um, COVID and the increase in anxiety and depression is 
extra severe in people who are younger, in people who are lower income. It affected mothers more so than fathers, and it um, devastated communities of color, Black or Hispanic, compared with um, Asian or white communities. There is reason to believe that at least some of these negative mental health effects are related to social distancing or to the social isolation resulting from social distancing. Uh, for example, it's been shown that people who shelter in place, so who are um, under lockdown, report more negative mental health uh, effects compared with people who are not sheltering in place. And another study showed essentially the same thing, that being under stay-at-home orders is associated with more depression, anxiety, insomnia, and stress. Actually, people's personal behaviors, so how much they adhere to social distancing guidelines is related to depression, anxiety as well. So here you can see that the more a person is social, social distancing, the more anxiety they would feel or the more anxiety symptoms they report. And the researchers of the study examined the role of social support, because like I said, it is very crucial in um, protecting our mental health. And unfortunately, although it does have a protective effect and it is negatively associated with symptoms, it cannot on its own eliminate the negative impact of social distancing. Here in New York City, this is a poll from May showing essentially what I just said, that alongside the financial uh, troubles that are really causing the uh, poor mental health um, symptoms, people really report over overwhelmingly <laughs> that being distant from other people is really what they feel is mostly driving their anxiety and depression. All of this is not to say, please do not see this as a recommendation to not socially distance. Social distancing is currently the one thing that is keeping us alive and it's our top priority right now. But we should be definitely mindful of the price that we're paying and how we can mitigate that. So pick up the phone, call your grandma, be nice to her, call her every day. Know her, let her know you're there. Be, um, just be mindful of that and protect yourself as well. There are um, phone numbers you can call your friends to reach out. Um, but for sure, we are going through something that is unprecedented. Um, not all is grim in the COVID world. So um, <laughs> there is a there is the concept of catastrophe compassion that has been uh, shown repeatedly uh, in which people undergoing or hit by disasters exhibit increased altruism and sense of camaraderie. This has been shown over and over again, whether after um, acts of violence like war or when natural disasters strike like uh, earthquake, earthquakes or um, floods and COVID is not different from that. Uh, theories in social psychology suggest that the origin of these catastrophe compassion, so this increase in pro-sociality, is linked to a sense of shared social identity. So people who have undergone this disaster or their um, their fellow survivors are considered they consider as comrades and would be sort of more prone to be pro-social for them as well as an increase in empathy after disasters um, driven by an increase in emotional connection. An example of that is uh, a recent study that showed that when people were, people are more likely to um, maintain social distancing when they were, uh, when they were told that it's done to protect others compared to when they were told that it was done to protect themselves. So people are, interested and are motivated to protect um, others, which is encouraging. Here at Sinai, my lab, um, supervised by Dr. Xiao Sigu, in the first wave of the United, in the United States have done 
longitudinal study to examine just that, to examine how altruism changed throughout the pandemic. Of course, at the time, we did not know the pandemic was going to go on for that long. And this is the time window in which we looked. So that is the, was not only the first wave at the time, we just thought it was the wave. Um, so you see there was an uptick in cases and then a slow decline. That's another way of plotting it. So there's a sharp increase and then a steady decline. And we measured how altruism changed using something called the dictator game. That is a task where participants are asked to choose between two options, option A and option B. In each option, there's some amount of points for them, some amount of points for the other person. Points are money in this case. And one of the options is always altruistic. In this case, it will be option A, because it has more points for the other person at a cost for the self, compared with option B. And we just measured how often participants choose the altruistic option at each time point during the study. We measured them for two months each uh, every other week to measure their behavior. What we found is that altruism went down with time. So seemingly contradicting the idea of catastrophe compassion. But if you remember, cases at the time were also going down. And indeed, what we find is that not that altruism decreased with time, it actually increased when the pandemic was at its worst and then declined as the cases became less, um, as the pandemic became less severe. We also looked into mental health in those same participants. We um, asked them how depressed and anxious they are at each week and looked at how that changed with time and with cases. And what we find is that although at the very beginning, people are very depressed and very anxious, this gray line is the clinical cutoff and it suggests that at the very beginning in early April it was, our participants were clinically anxious with time, they, the numbers go down almost to a baseline level. So that is encouraging. Again, like I said, people, of course, are not all the same. So levels of depression and anxiety are very related to demographic factors. Here you can see um, younger people in the blue line are more depressed than older people in the yellow line. They're also more anxious. Women are more depressed and anxious than men, and people of lower income are more depressed and anxious compared with people of higher income. So you can see that repeatedly overall for all of these populations, the numbers are going down. So as the pandemic became less severe and as time went on, people have adapted, suggesting that we are resilient and adaptive and we can um, overcome this. So with that, I'd like to sign to end with some optimistic ideas. I see two sources for hope at this point. One is that we have technology. Technology is huge. It allows us to interact with others, even when we're alone at home. And people rate online interactions when they have video on them. So not just audio, but audiovisual as equally satisfying as face to face. And the second thing is, like I said, humans are highly adaptable, flexible creatures, and we can use that to our advantage. We will, with time, we become more comfortable with this situation. People are um, adaptable both on the neural level, so we know that the brain changes all throughout our life. It changes, it changes in response to changing environment or aging or trauma, like if you get a... Um, after physical trauma, the brain reorganizes to compensate. Also, when you learn new things, the brain changes all the time. And that is a source of hope for us because it means that we can change and we evolve. Obviously, it's bounded. We will not, because we're so social, we can never adapt to be not social, but we can adapt to live the way we live right now until it changes. And second thing is that um, we're also socially flexible. There's social plasticity. Social norms change all the time, and they will change back, and we change with them, and our expectations change, and that is the most important thing. And I like to end with my favorite uh, COVID anecdote. I think that we've all 
very quickly adapted to when we watch TV and somebody enters a crowded um, elevator without a mask on, you cringe, right? You have that feeling like, oh, what are you doing? It feels so wrong. And we've learned that in the time span of, what, a month, two months? Much like we've learned to cringe when that happens. Once the pandemic is over, we're all over it. We'll go back to not cringing from it and embracing our fellow men <laughs> huddled together in a crowded elevator or subway cart. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schuster, for that wonderful talk. Now we'll be turning things over to a Q&A panel with our experts uh, reading questions that were submitted to us online. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our question and answer panel with our two experts here. So we're going to start by asking some questions that we received uh, from people on social media. So the first question is for either of you to answer. It says, what are some safe ways that we can socialize during the pandemic that still engage these brain uh, social circuits? I think, I okay. think yeah, uh, outside with masks on. I think that's this now, especially with the weather is warmer. I think the best way is still to interact face to face outside if possible in small groups with masks on. Or is there any, any problem with that? Right. I, I, I definitely agree with that. I think if you can't uh, do that, or that's not like, you know, you'll feel safe on that. Um, I would say video games. Video games are a great way to interact with your friends. Um, you can have different, you know, uh, what's, what's what I'm looking for? Different chat rooms. I think Discord is what people use. Um, and that way you can get the, you know, the, uh, the video and audio, you know, you can see their faces and whatnot. But also you can like actually use an actual avatar. So that avatar is working as like, you know, the, the body, the, 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 the virtual physical interaction. Mm -hmm. So I think like, yeah, like I would say, you know, first and foremost, like, like, uh, like you said, yeah, like the chief just said, um, sorry, uh, that I would go outside and you know, mask on and whatnot. But if you're unable to do that, if you don't feel safe doing that, I think, you know, these virtual Zoom meetings, discords um, mm -hmm. with video games and stuff like that is also a good alternative. Awesome. And then maybe getting a pet, <laughs> which I know a lot of people have been doing. As long as you won't. Um... As long as you'll keep it forever. Right. And not give it back once it's all A over. forever companion. Yes. yes. Okay. So moving on to our next question. Again, this is directed for either of you. So there's been increased social media usage during COVID as a means of staying connected to people since we cannot see each other face to face a lot of times. So the question is, does our brain process uh, these social interactions on social media the same way? And does this type of socializing, is it still as rewarding for us or is it affecting our brain differently? Yeah, so I'm gonna go a little back over that one. I don't know if it's as rewarding. Mm -hmm. um, I would say it has a different rewarding flavor to it. Um, you can think of people who have uh, Facebook or you know any type of other um, social media addictions where they're like, you know, they're doing everything they can, you know, for likes or they're, they're did it for the gram or whatever you would want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would I would definitely say that those like are social in nature and they have been um, they're, they're rewarding feelings. Um, but in terms of actually um, being social, having the actual interaction, um, I think we were talking earlier about you know Instagram. While people can see you doing things, um, there's no actual interaction there, um, which actually you know doesn't allow for what we you know normally in this for example like we're sitting here now we're engaging with one another we can't really do that with um something like instagram or any other social media uh, uh, platform mm -hmm. i know that there's research showing that in general text-based uh, interaction is less satisfying than face-to-face -face or any kind of um, visual interaction where you can actually see the person so whether it's online or in person mm -hmm. so i think it's Based on that research, I would assume it's less rewarding. I also feel that way personally as a user. Mm -hmm. And definitely not all, it's not really an interaction if it's they're just reading somebody else's post, especially because I think there is, um, a, people present a warped image of themselves on social media, so it could actually be detrimental if you're at home depressed and you feel like everybody's 
baking and learning a new language and all those things while well, you're just watching TV and like slowly withering away. That could be, I think, just hurtful. Yeah. That being said, like you can make the most of what you have. So right. Yeah. So maybe a more effective means of virtual socialization would be like a Zoom call where you get the face to face interaction. Yeah. Um, because that seems to be the most important thing. Yeah. I think at some point, at least in the early days of the pandemic, there were like Zoom parties that you could mm -hmm. attend mm -hmm. and some platforms that are like pair you up with random people as if like mm -hmm. you would walk into. So maybe that could be more reminiscent of like real life social interactions, which I would predict to be more rewarding. Right. I agree with that. Awesome. All right. So our next question is um, related to COVID-induced sort of stress and anxiety. So this question says that um, oftentimes this COVID-induced stress actually makes them feel more socially withdrawn, but then socially withdrawing makes them feel worse. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why does stress make people socially withdraw? And is what is the best thing to do when you feel that way? Should you withdraw socially or should you do a uh, sort of opposite action to that? Oh man, I'm gonna need a minute to think about that one. Okay. I'll take a stab at it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I don't know too much about stress, but in terms of loneliness, for example, mm -hmm. um, it can be beneficial. Um, mm -hmm. Feeling lonely would make you wanna go out you know, and interact with people. I guess you can think of loneliness as a type of stress. Mm -hmm. um, if you are lonely, you could feel stressed. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think like, you know, it is a good thing to want to go out and like, you know, talk to people and whatnot. But I think that the issue is, and this is a very unique for COVID, is that the actual going out and interacting with people is what's causing the stress. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like, you know, battling with itself. Um, so I think, you know, so actually, r remind me of the overall question so I can, uh, you know, have a succinct answer. I guess, sort of, to summarize it, it should you, um, why does stress make us feel sort of socially withdrawn? And is the best way to respond to that to socially withdraw or to maybe make an effort to see a loved right. one or something? So, okay, so yeah, so I think it depends on the type of stress. So the stress from, you know, not wanting to get about when sick or, you know, from COVID or stuff like that, that, you know, causes us to be withdrawn. Mm -hmm. But a different type of stress, like I was saying before, loneliness, you know, what makes us want to um, interact with people. So they're kind of like competing with each other. And the question is, isn't like stress itself, but does what type of stress, like, you know, is, mm -hmm. is it, uh, which one wins this balance? Like, what is the... Uh, if you're if you're so like lonely, you're like I gotta see people, I gotta go out, you know. Then you know that that one might win out. Versus like you know you know uh, I want to protect people, I want this and that, so I'm going to you know. Now I think give an example myself. Uh, my family's from California. I haven't been home a little bit. So, but for me, it's like you know, do I go home? You know, mm -hmm. potentially expose them to you know whatever I, I might have, or do I stay here? So uh, it's not really stress. You know, you just. Blanket. It's like what mm -hmm. are the competing uh, factors that are involved? Right. I think I don't think there's a good if if what we know across the board is that social support helps when you feel any kind of negative emotion. Mm -hmm. Social support, like your friends, your family, organizations, um, should always help. Obviously, if you're feeling like you want to curl up into a ball on your sofa and not talk to anybody, it's hard to get yourself out there and get mm -hmm. the help you need. But I would, yes, encourage to seek it out. If not in person, then right. like we talked, like video games or call hotline or call a friend or um, whatever. There are like many hobbies you can do that are social right. in nature. Um, Socially withdrawing has like a spiral effect. Mm -hmm. Often, like the more alone you are, the more alone you'll want to be. Because mm -hmm. usually, it's other people that make us get out of that right. situation. So, I would encourage to seek out the company of other people 
if it's for children, so be it. If it's outside, then that's I'm socially distant and that's uh, maybe preferable, but whatever gets you out of that. Great. Okay. All right, so our next question is, do we lose an important component of social interaction when we are covering our face with a mask or can we still perceive social interactions the same way? 100% yes. <laughs> I, that's not scientific data. That's my own uh, belief. Um, but yeah, I mean, our eyes, you know, we, a lot of information is processed through the eyes. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the mouth and whatnot makes, there's a lot of muscles in there that allow us to do many different types of um, different expressions, you know, that are, you know, independent of just our eyes. Mm -hmm. um, I might be, you know, smiling. Uh, I mean, I might be like smiling through my eyes, but you have to be making a frown face. You know, there's different uh, levels um, to uh, facial expressions. Um, so I do believe that we actually lose a bit of uh, a bit of um, understanding uh, from other people without you know having uh, access to the mouth. Uh, I know for myself, I, when I talk to certain people, I, I really have to like listen to what they're saying to like really engage or like uh, to understand what they're uh, what they mean. Mm -hmm. Instead of before, I can just like you know, read kind of read their facial expressions and get a gist of what they're trying to talk about. But losing access to that means now I have to like look at their how their hands are gesturing, look at like you know the tone of their voice, look at other things to help me get what I lost uh, from uh, from their face being covered up. Mm -hmm. um, I have a few uh, points. Like I have a few answers to that question. Mm -hmm. I think first of all, like Joe said in his presentation, social communication has many parts to it, and facial expressions and just the mouth uh, area of the face is only one of them. So we communicate with our bodies, and that's we still have that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one. The other is that I know. Like I said in my talk, that social norms change and we change with them. And I feel personally that with because of the mask, I now sort of gesticulate. Is that the word? Mm -hmm. I yeah. like much more. Yeah. Like I right. try to be like very exaggerated in my body right. language to compensate for the fact that my mouth is not visible. Right. Um, the other thing is that there are cultures which have face coverings as mm -hmm. part of their um, wardrobe, like mm -hmm. Muslim, some Muslim uh, countries. And they obviously have, are communicating successfully. Right. So mm -hmm. there are obviously ways to overcome that. Right. That's true. And as well as like countries like, I know Hong Kong or places where wearing a mask has been common like pre-COVID because mm -hmm. of other, um, just from the flu season and Obviously, if they can make it work, there's no reason why it would be different. And I think right. the last thing I want to say is that I think it's something that is on the mind of every parent because for small children growing up now without seeing faces, I think there's a lot of worry about is it going to hinder their social development in some way? Mm -hmm. And from what I know, um, it shouldn't because most of the people that they're interacting with are at home, so their parents or caregivers who are not wearing a mask at home. So that's that's most of the stimuli they're getting. And the other thing is that one of the advice that um, experts give is to try and, when you're interacting with a small child, just be vocal about like verbally say your emotions. If you think mm -hmm. they're not like very well seen because of your mask, just be like, oh, I'm very sad right now. So there are other right. ways to, again, just compensate. It's all a game of adapting to the environment and what we right. have and use what we have. Right. There are, there are a lot of ways to convey social information, basically. Exactly. exactly. We have lost something, but it is like we can compensate with the right. tools. And I, I think that's an important part of yeah. it. Like if you're able to compensate uh, for the loss of something else. Um, for example, you know, when we lose our hearing or whatnot, you're able to compensate with uh, sign language or some type of other thing. So even though we lose something, we're still able to you know, uh, like you said before, it's classic social plasticity. Mm -hmm. We're able to um, overcome that and, you know, still be social. Right, right. Like the example you gave at the end of your talk, how now we cringe when we From, see yeah. TV shows that in crowded restaurants or elevators. But pretty soon when things go back to 
uh, state where we can be in crowded spaces again <laughs> pretty soon. Um, then that sort of response that we have, that cringe response, will go away because we adapt to what yeah. we perceive to be socially normal. Yeah. And, and you can even think of it now in terms of like how like I, I like like a, a movie of like you know oh my god that was how times used to be you know so mm -hmm. right, exactly right yeah all right so then I have one last question for you guys so this one is related to what you, uh, Dr. Schuster was talking about um, in your talk you said that um, sort of this pandemic-induced social isolation has increased rates of depression, anxiety, and substance use disorders. So this question is about sort of what causes, uh, what about social isolation causes these increases in these sort of different conditions? Um, and I guess what's going on in the brain? I think well, first of all, the science shows that we need other people. Mm -hmm. When we don't have them, that causes sort of the entire body and brain to, to go into stress mode, much like any other kind of hurt, like when you're during wartime, when you, like, um, there's like famine, hunger, like stuff like that. When you're, it's a, it's a basic human need to be interacting with other people. When you lose that, going to have consequences across the board. Depression and anxiety are just like one that we focused on. I'm sure there are other like, physical responses that we were not yet even fully understanding. Um, what generates it? I think it's a, uh, it's, it's that, it's the fact that we need it and we were deprived from it and that causes this like chain reaction that ends with depression. I also think it's a lot of it is not just social isolation. It's the fact that we're going through, we're living in uncertainty and uncertainty has horrible also consequences <laughs> for the reward system of the brain is very sensitive to that. I mean, it's, it's a, um, there's aversion to uh, uncertainty. There's aversion to ambiguity. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I think that's also a huge part is to being afraid for your health, the health of your loved ones. Mm -hmm. Those are all risk factors also for depression, anxiety, um, and all of these. And I assume that they're all in some way um, mediated by the reward system of the brain, but it's speculative. I would say. Do you have anything to add? No, that sounds great to me. <laughs> So it could be that since we are deprived of sort of social interaction, which we deem naturally rewarding for us, that could be altering uh, something in the brain that's related to like depression, anxiety, even substance use disorders. It's also it also could be that we're deprived of. Let's say you lose your job or mm -hmm. something else bad happens in your life that is related to COVID or not. Mm -hmm. One of the ways you usually cope with that is by relying on your friends, family, doing mm -hmm. fun stuff outside. Right. All of these things that we don't have. So we, yeah. it's not only that social isolation is causing depression, right. it's also just not there to help you cope with other things that might cause depression. Gotcha. It actually made me think of the, uh, this might be dated now, but made me think of the TV show Cheers. You mm -hmm. know, like after everything's over, you know, you go hang out, you know, uh, I would drink with your friends or whatnot, but a, a lot of these things are gone. So, mm -hmm. like the way you de-stress, yeah. you know, is, is, is you know you can't de-stress anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I, I think you know they're kind of compounding on each other, which you know, and, and for a lot of like uh, substances, they allow for you know you have like what dopamine releases. You have like they're, mm -hmm. they're rewarding in themselves. So it's kind of like a uh, a crutch for you know something that's been lost. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be my only like two cents mm -hmm. <laughs> on, on, on that subject. All right, that was our last question. So do you guys have any uh, parting words for our audience? This is incredibly difficult. I think if it helps, it helps me to know that it's incredibly difficult and it's okay to feel like it's incredibly difficult, but it'll pass. Um, and hopefully next time there is a pandemic, we'll be better prepared. So do what you need to protect yourself, do what you need to protect your loved ones physically and mentally. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Um, for me, uh, it's kind of the same thing. I think a friend always tells me, uh, this too shall pass. Um, humanity has been around for a pretty long time, you know? Um, and as, as a species, we have seen many different, you know, pandemics, plagues, whatever, what have you. Mm -hmm. Um, and the difference between this one and the other ones is we're around for it. Mm -hmm. Um, but this too shall pass. And just having that, you know, understanding, you know, having that knowledge that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, um, is, you know, it, it brings me hope. I, 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 I'll say that much. It brings me hope. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's my, that's my, uh, that's how, I, that's what I'm going on. This too shall pass. All right, so that will conclude our public lecture series for this year. Um, thank you everyone for joining us and participating in this year's Brain Awareness Week. We know it was very different from what we typically do other years. Um, so thank you. Remember to take care of your health, both physical and mental, and we hope to see you again next year. Bye.